Hello, everyone. What is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct, you guys. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah, and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every single Wednesday, and you guys are not going to want to miss it. We also upload the video version onto YouTube on Wednesdays as well, so make sure you are subscribed. And with that all being said, you guys, guys. Happy Halloween. If you are unfamiliar, this week is Halloween and I could not be more excited. I've been mentioning it to you guys for the past couple weeks that for the week leading up to Halloween, you are getting back-to-back true crime episodes here on Killer Instinct. From October 28th to Thursday, October 31st, you are going to be getting a new episode every single day. If you have been an avid Killer Instinct listener for a while, you would know that Halloween is something that we do pretty much every year. However, last year, we decided to take the year off, and I know so many of you were flooding my inbox, my DMs, asking for Halloween to come back, and I am so excited that we get to do it again this year. So like I said, for the next four days leading up to Halloween, you are going to be getting a new true crime Halloween-related episode every day. And as you can tell by the title of today's episode, today, we are starting Halloween off with a murder that captivated the nation and got coined the trick or treat slaying. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. This case starts with a man named Peter Fabiano. Now, 35-year-old Peter was a Marine Corps veteran of World War II, and at the time that this case takes place, he was the owner of a beauty salon in downtown Los Angeles. After the Marine Corps, Peter moved to LA and was bartending when he met a woman named Betty. At the time that they met, Betty was recently divorced from her ex-husband, and she was a single mom of two kids, Judy and Richard. Now, at the time that Betty and Peter met, Betty was working at the beauty salon. She really was the one that got Peter involved in this business because when she met Peter, again, he was working his bartender gig. And when she met him, she suggested to him that he leave his bartending job and come work for her at the beauty salon, which Peter ultimately did. And after this, the two became partners not only in business, but in life as well. They ended up opening another beauty salon to Together that became wildly successful, and not only that, in 1955, the two of them got married. So now that you have a little bit of a background, I want to jump to October 31st of 1957, and this is in Sun Valley, California, which is right outside of Los Angeles. Now, on October 31st, 1957, Peter, Betty, and Judy had spent the night passing out candy to all of the trick-or-treaters. Halloween had fallen on a school night in 1957, so trick-or-treating came to an end at a pretty reasonable hour, and by 11 o'clock p.m. that night, Peter and Betty and Judy were all getting ready to go to bed for the night. Judy had gone to her bedroom, Peter and Betty had gone to their bedroom, and right when they were about to get in bed, that is when Peter and Betty heard another knock on the door. Now, both Peter and Betty were surprised about this because they thought it was a little late for kids to still be out trick-or-treating. It was 11 o'clock. Again, it was a school night. They figured that this was a pretty late stop for a trick-or-treater, but nonetheless, Peter told Betty that he would take it over and he would handle it, and for her to wait in bed, he would be right back. Now, while Betty waited in bed, Peter walked downstairs, and according to Betty, she said that she remembered hearing Peter let out a little bit of a chuckle, saying, isn't it a little late for this, to the trick-or-treater at the door. However, right after him saying that, Betty said that she heard someone responding back with no, and seconds later, a gunshot went off. 
After hearing the gunshot, Betty said that she raced down the stairs and found Peter lying on his back in the entryway of the home. Peter was clutching his chest by the time that Betty had gotten to him, and he was losing a lot of blood very, very quickly. Now, because of the loud gunshot, Judy had also woken up at this time, and she ran out into the entryway to see what was going on. At this point, Betty frantically told her to go get help. She ran two doors down to their neighbor named Bud Adler's home. Now, Bud was actually a police officer for the Los Angeles Police Department at the time. Judy ran to his door and was banging on it frantically until he finally answered. At this point, she told Bud that Peter had been shot, and Bud immediately called several officers in the Valley Division of the LAPD to Peter's home, and they arrived very quickly. They arrived within minutes after the shooting. Now, Peter was quickly transported to the Sun Valley Hospital. However, sadly, upon arrival, he succumbed to his injuries and passed away from the gunshot wound in his chest. Now, back at the crime scene, detectives were canvassing the area and the home for any potential evidence that could have been left behind. However, there was very little to be found. Even though there was a lot of blood, there was no gun shell casings left behind. Their only witness to this murder was a 15-year-old boy who was walking through the neighborhood. Now, when police spoke to this 15-year-old boy, he said that after he heard the gunshot, he saw a car speeding off out of the neighborhood very shortly after 11 p.m. However, he said that because it was dark outside, he wasn't able to get a good look at any of the passengers inside of the car. Now, while they were trying to find any potential evidence that was left at the crime scene, police were also trying to figure out at this point what the motive was in Peter's murder. Now, for all things considered, this seemed like a very, very random shooting. Police wondered at first if this could have been a robbery gone wrong. The Fabianos did have a very nice home. They were very successful in their salons, so it would have been easy to go inside and take the belongings that were inside of the home. Home. However, nothing was missing or stolen. Everything was in its place, and it really seemed like the only target in the home was Peter. Again, after Peter got shot, no one continued walking through the home. No one went after Betty. No one went after Judy. It simply was just Peter. Now, the next question that police had was if this could possibly be a gang hit, but this motive was eliminated pretty quickly when police went through Peter's criminal history and found that there was no None. So that was crossed off of the list as well. After running through the list of these potential motives, police really started to realize that this was a targeted attack on Peter and Peter alone. So now that they had the motive behind the attack, they needed to figure out why. Why someone would want to hurt Peter, let alone kill Peter. Now, Peter's murder very quickly grabbed the attention of the media. And again, like I said in the beginning, it was coined as the trick or treat slaying. People became captivated trying to figure out who would murder Peter, and it really sent Los Angeles into a panic, thinking that there was an unknown gunman on the loose, and people were worried for their own safety, thinking that they could potentially be next. Now, at this point in the investigation, police wanted to sit down with Betty. They wanted to have a good understanding of who Peter was and also if Peter had any known enemies. Again, because police were very certain that this was a targeted attack against Peter, they wanted to figure out if there was anyone out there who didn't like Peter or would want to hurt him. And typically in these cases, when we talk about our victims, we talk about them having no known enemies. Everyone loved them, everyone really liked them, they couldn't think of someone who would possibly want to hurt them. However, for Peter, that was not exactly the case. While Peter was a very well-liked man, there was one person in particular that did not like Peter at all. All. Betty knew that there was someone out there who hated Peter and would want him gone if given the opportunity, and that person was a woman named Joan Rabel. Joan was a 40-year-old woman born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1917 and was living in Hollywood. She was a successful woman who worked as a writer and a photographer, and in 1957, the same year that Peter was murdered, Joan had gone into Peter's salon one day looking for work. Peter hired her, and she ended up doing part-time 
work at the salon as a receptionist, and through working there, Joan ended up becoming very good friends with Betty. Now, Betty was very transparent with police in telling them that Peter never really liked Joan. After hiring her for the receptionist gig and after Joan got a little bit closer with Betty, Peter always had a suspicion about the friendship that was going on between Betty and Joan, and he struggled with if this friendship was purely platonic or if Joan had an ulterior romantic motive towards his wife. Betty said that Peter was very vocal with her about his suspicions about Joan. He would say things like Joan was obsessed with her. However, Betty didn't believe it and strictly thought that Peter was being paranoid and just trying to drive a wedge between her and a new friend. Now, this created a lot of tension between Betty and Peter in their marriage. And I do want to say it's never been exactly clear what the nature of the relationship ended up being with Betty and Joan, whether they were platonic or more than that. However, it definitely created a divide between Betty and Peter that was so strong that it ended up causing Betty to move out of the home at one point, and she moved in with Joan. Betty said that this new arrangement was always going to be temporary. She never figured that she was going to be staying at Joan's for an extended period of time. It really was just something for the time being while she navigated what the next steps were in her marriage and navigated what was going to happen between her and Peter. But Joan was very, very happy with this new arrangement, and she wanted to keep Betty at her house for as long as possible. Over time, Betty started to see different tendencies that Joan had that really confirmed some of Peter's suspicions. Betty herself has said that Joan definitely seemed a little bit more romantically interested in her by the time that she moved into Joan's house with her. But again, Betty always had her hopes set on moving back in with Peter and working on their marriage, which ultimately she did. Now, one of Peter's non-negotiables after moving back in with him was that Betty needed to terminate her relationship and her friendship with Joan altogether. Peter said that she needed to be let go from the salon and also that her and Betty needed to stop having any communication. And when Peter expressed this to Betty, Betty agreed. She said okay because she wanted to work on her marriage and that was the most important thing to her at the time. So Betty completely cut off Joan at that time and moved back in with Peter. Now once she moved back into the home, Betty and Peter were at a better place in their relationship and in their marriage. However, as you can imagine, Joan was not happy with this whatsoever. Betty told police that Joan consistently tried to tell her all these horrible things about Peter and why she shouldn't be with Peter and that she should leave Peter, divorce Peter, and move on with her life. So when Betty went back with Peter, Joan was incredibly, incredibly upset by this. Betty said that she believes that Joan could have been so upset that she would have had motive and she would have been capable of murder. She believed that Joan did have a reason to get rid of Peter because it would have given her a chance to possibly rekindle things with Betty. As you can imagine, at this point, after speaking with Betty, police now needed to talk to Joan, and immediately upon sitting down with her, Joan was adamant that she had absolutely nothing to do with Peter's death. She also claimed that she had an alibi for the night of Halloween, the night of Peter's murder. She said that she was home the entirety of the night. Now, police also spoke with neighbors of Joan who said that Joan's car remained in her driveway throughout the entirety of that night. Now, police also spoke with neighbors of Joan who said that, yes, her car did remain in the driveway for the entire night. However, even though Joan made it seem like she was at home, her alibi was quickly unraveled because police spoke with a friend of Joan's named Margaret. According to Margaret, she told police that she was very good friends with Joan, they had a very good relationship, and that the night of Halloween, Joan had asked asked Margaret if she could borrow her car, which Margaret agreed to let her do. Now, with this new information, it showed police that Joan was trying to make it seem as if she was home, almost to set up her alibi for her by leaving her car in the driveway to try and solidify, again, that she was not out that night. However, she was out. She was just using Margaret's car instead. 
Now, about two weeks after Peter's murder, police received another tip that really was the smoking gun in this case, and this time it was an anonymous tip, and it was from someone who urged police to look at a storage locker of a Bullock department store in Los Angeles. Now, the person who called in this tip claimed that if police were to look, they would find the gun that killed Peter inside one of those lockers. Now, the tips in this case that police were getting were few and far between, so when they did get a tip, they followed up with every single one. So at this point, police went to the Bullock department store, went into the storage locker, and that was when they found the 38 caliber Smith & Wesson gun inside of that storage unit. Now, after further examination, police were able to figure out who the gun was registered to. Now, this is what led them to another woman. This woman was named Golden Pizer. Golden was a medical secretary, and her and Joan had been friends for four years leading up to Peter's murder. It was also reported that just as much as Joan was obsessed with Betty, Golden also had a very similar infatuation to Joan and would do anything she could to please her, even if that meant murder. After Betty and Joan's falling out, Joan and Golden began spending a lot of time together, and during that time, Joan would vent to Golden about the time that she spent with Betty, and she confided in her about the falling out that her and Betty had. She expressed her frustrations about Peter going back with Betty and said that Peter was an evil evil man. Joan told Golden that Peter was a drug dealer who was abusive towards Betty, and Joan wanted to give Peter what he deserved. Now, it was through these conversations that Joan and Golden had, Joan started to realize the power that she had over Golden. She realized how much Golden liked her, she realized how infatuated Golden was with her, and she realized that through those things, she would be able to manipulate and convince Golden to do the unthinkable. Now, after the police found this gun and saw that it was registered to Golden's name, police showed up at Golden's doorstep and Golden knew immediately why they were there. It did not take long after police arrived on Golden's doorstep for her to confess to absolutely everything. Golden told police that Joan had asked her to murder Peter for her. She said that Joan had given her money to purchase this gun and that she bought the gun from a gun shop in Pasadena on September 21st, so weeks before the murder, over a month prior to this murder, which told police that this was very premeditated and that Joan had been thinking and planning and plotting for quite some time. Golden said that on the night of Halloween, which again, the night of the murder, they drove to Peter's home, they being Golden and Joan. Golden also told police that on that night, the two of them dressed up for this occasion. They both wore black superhero eye masks, they were wearing red gloves, and Golden was also hiding the gun inside of a brown paper bag. Golden said that Joan showed up to her home with the disguises for both of them to wear, and the two of them got dressed up and drove over to Peter's house shortly after. Golden said that by the time they actually got to the home, it was about 9 o'clock p.m., so they waited for two hours hours for all of the lights to go off to indicate that everyone was going to sleep. And when that happened, that is when Joan stayed in the car and Golden was the one who walked right up to the front door, pointed the brown paper bag at Peter, and shot him right then and there. She said that afterwards, she raced back into the car and that her and Joan drove off. She said that Joan then dropped her back off at home and told Golden, quote unquote, forget you ever knew me. Golden said that in that moment, she realized that she had been played, essentially. She realized that Joan had manipulated her and that the entire relationship that they had was built off of a lie. It was at this point she really realized that Joan had only been using her this whole time to really get to Peter, and not only get to Peter, but get Peter out of the way so Joan could ultimately be with Betty. Golden realized at that point that Joan didn't want to have anything to do with 
with her. She was just having Golden do her dirty work for her. When talking to police, Golden told them, quote, I had no motive personally. Whatever motive I had was to please Joan. I was always easily influenced. I have been impressionable and always trusting, end quote. She also told police that she felt fully relieved to get all of this off of her chest and to finally confess. In two weeks after Peter's murder, Golden was arrested and Joan was also arrested. Now, after their arrest, both women ended up undergoing psychological evaluations and the psychiatrist said that in regards to Golden, it was believed that Golden's only thought throughout the entire process leading up to the murder was to save Joan. They really just tried to emphasize that Golden was really just following in Joan's footsteps and that she was being submissive towards Joan, who was really the ringleader throughout all of this. Now, the prosecutors did try and plead insanity for both women, stating that both of them being gay could be grounds enough for them to be unfit to stand trial, which is absolutely mind-blowing when you think about it. But again, we are talking about the 1950s. Both Joan and Golden pled not guilty by reason of insanity. Golden said, quote, Joan told me that Peter was an evil man, that he was mean to his wife, and that he had threatened Joan. I've always been the kind of person who's faithful to her friends. Joan was my friend. I'd known her for four years. I was so worried about her. She kept telling me about Peter Fabiano, how much he absolutely hated her. I couldn't think anymore. She almost had me under a hypnotic spell. I've never hurt anyone, but I would do anything for a friend, end quote. Now, Joan was said that throughout the trial, first of all, she declined to testify, so she did not speak in the trial, but it was said that she sat the entire time throughout the trial with a very unsettling grin on her face, really throughout the entirety of it, seemingly not having a single regret. Joan did not seem remorseful in the trial. She did not seem to have any sort of compassion for Betty or Golden or anyone. All she did was sit there and smirk. Now, on March 11th, 1958, both Joan and Golden were convicted of second-degree murder, and both of them were sentenced to five years to life in prison. In terms of how long they actually spent in prison, this is where things get a little unclear. I have searched high and low trying to figure out how long both Joan and Golden remained in prison, but I was unable to find that answer. But what we do know is that Golden ended up passing away when she was 83 years old in 1998 in Los Angeles after she was released. But again, we don't know how long she was in jail or how long it had been after her release before her death. There really are no records anywhere that are available to the public that state where Golden went or what she did after her release from prison. And the same really goes for Joan. When it comes to Joan, there again was very, very minimal information out there, which again, I know is very frustrating in regards to having some sort of closure on this case. But when it comes to Joan, I again searched high and low trying to find as many records as I could. The only Joan that I was able to find with the same name had passed away in Los Angeles in 2012, which would have made her approximately 95 years old. I don't want to confidently say that without a shadow of a doubt that is her because again, there is very little information about that and there is little information in that obituary pointing to anyone really. It literally just says the name and the date of the passing. So what happened to both Golden and Joan after their sentencing really remains a mystery to this day, but it is assumed that Joan and Golden were both released at similar times. I do find it interesting that they really were released at all considering the premeditation that took place in this murder. Murdering Peter was something that was planned. It was thought out. It was calculated. Joan was very manipulative throughout the entirety of that planning process and even afterwards. And the fact that both women were able to be released after a certain period of time is surprising. Now, what we do know is that after the trial, Betty ended up selling the beauty salon that her and Peter owned, and she remarried in 1966. However, she did pass away in 1999. Now, that, you guys, is the case of the trick-or-treat slaying. It is the case of the murder of Peter Fabiano, and I am so curious to know what you think think about it. I'm very curious to know if you guys think, as I did, that both Joan and Golden should have been sentenced for a longer period of time, for example, a life in prison. I'm also curious
curious to know what you think about the second degree murder charge in and of itself. The fact that they were charged with second degree and not first degree. The fact that Joan was charged with second degree murder and there was no first degree murder charge. Again, Joan was not the one who pulled the trigger, but Joan was the puppeteer behind the entire Peter Fabiano murder plot. So I'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say about it. But with that being said, you guys, that is the end of Halloween episode one. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know what you think in the comments below. And with that being said, that is all for me today, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. Again, if you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. Again, we post weekly here on the podcast every single Wednesday, except for this week when we are doing every single day leading up to Halloween. I will be back tomorrow with a brand new case for you guys and I will see you there. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys.